Hello, everyone. I'm Daniela Costa, the OIV Press Officer, and along with the OIV team, we are very pleased to welcome you to our press conference. Before starting, just some technical details. This conference is being translated into three languages, French, English, and Spanish. You may choose the language of your preference on the menu on the left side of your application. Know also that during the press conference, you are invited to ask your questions on the application's chat. We will start our press conference with our Director General, Mr. John Barker, presentation. And now, without no further ado, please welcome our Director General, Mr. John Barker. Hello and welcome everyone to the OIV's press conference on the state of the world wine and wine sector. The OIV is the international scientific and technical reference for the wine and wine sector. And one of our missions is to gather global statistics. And we hold this conference every April to present the most up-to-date compilation of data on production, consumption, and trade for the past year. Today, I will cover three main topics. First, I will present the data on vineyard surface areas, wine production, wine consumption, and international trade for the 2023 calendar year. Second, I will offer some preliminary estimates of wine production in the Southern Hemisphere for 2024. And finally, I'd like to conclude with some thoughts on the current challenges and opportunities facing the vine and wine sector and the role that the OIV can play to support the sector in the future. So let's get started with a look at the recent evolution of the world vineyard surface area. In 2023, the global surface area under grapevines was 7.2 million hectares. This figure includes planted grapevines for all uses, wine, table grapes, dried grapes, juices, spirits, vinegars, and the rest. This represents a small reduction of 0.5% compared to 2022. This is the third consecutive year that the world vineyard has decreased in size as vine growing countries in both hemispheres adjust to increased production costs and a decline in consumption. As you can see in the pie chart, despite the large number of vine growing nations globally, 94 in total, more than half of the world's viticultural areas are concentrated within the top six countries, which make up 56% of the global vineyard. The EU vineyard, which is mostly cultivated with wine grapes, accounts for 45% of the world's total, while the Southern Hemisphere has about 12% of the global vineyard. Now let's examine the trends over the past decade in major vine growing countries. Spain maintains its position as the largest vineyard globally in 2023, covering 945,000 hectares, followed by France with 792,000 hectares and China with 756,000 hectares. The top 10 is then completed by Italy, Turkey, the USA, Argentina, Romania, Portugal and India entering the top 10 for the first time. It is noteworthy that eight of the top 10 vine growing countries did not experience growth in vineyard size last year, with Italy and India being the exceptions. Portugal and China experienced the most significant decreases, with the vineyard area shrinking by 5.8% and 5.6% respectively. We now move on to wine production. Global wine production in 2023 is estimated at 237 million hectolitres, representing a decline of almost 25 million hectolitres, down 10% compared with 2022. This decline is attributed to extreme environmental conditions, drought, extreme heat and fires, as well as heavy rain causing flooding and fungal diseases across major northern and southern hemisphere wine producing regions. This has resulted in the smallest global wine production volume since 1961. The global total of 237 million hectolitres is smaller than our first estimate back in October because some countries, notably Italy and Spain, significantly revised their final figures downward. 
If you look at the time series, overall global production is trending downwards slightly, as you would expect from the decrease in vineyard area, but the most evident feature is the year-to-year -year variability of production. If we look at the breakdown of global production in the pie chart, we can highlight a few key points. Overall, wine production is dominated by the top three countries, France, Italy and Spain, which account for almost half of the total wine produced in 85 countries at the world level. The top eight producers are responsible for three quarters of the world's production. The European Union represents 62% of global production. In 2023, it produced a total of 145 million hectolitres, a decrease of 11% on the previous year. The Southern Hemisphere, representing 20% of global production, last year produced 47 million hectolitres, a decrease of 15% on 2022. So you can see that the production losses were experienced across both hemispheres. On this slide, we see the ranking of the top 20 wine producing countries. The red bars on the top show the production value in 2023. The blue bars in the bottom show percentage changes against 2022. You can see that a small production increase in France, coupled with a significant fall in production in both Italy and Spain, down 23% and 21% respectively, means that France regains the position of the world's largest producer in 2023 with 48 million hectolitres. In fourth place, we have the USA, whose 2023 production is relatively large, estimated at more than 24 million hectolitres. As you can see from the blue bars in the lower half of the slide, all large Southern Hemisphere countries recorded very low production volumes, with yearly variations ranging from minus 10% to minus 26%. The only exception is Brazil, which reported a 12% increase compared to 2022. It is also worth noting the sharp production decreases in China and Greece of 33% and 34% respectively. Let's now have a look at the demand side. World wine consumption in 2023 is estimated at 221 million litres, down 2.6 on 2022. This is the lowest level of consumption since 1996. If we focus on the years since 2018, we can see that global wine consumption has been trending downwards for the past five years, despite an upward boost in 2021 as countries emerged from COVID restrictions. The decline in consumption reflects a number of disturbances in the global market. COVID-19, followed by the war in Ukraine and consequent supply chain disruptions, and more recently, the strong inflationary pressures in many key markets. Inflation has been a key factor in the past two years because it has significantly increased production and distribution costs while also reducing consumers' purchasing power. The global consumption data is also affected by a steep decline in China's wine consumption, which decreased by an average of 2 million hectolitres per year in recent years. Wine is a product that is enjoyed globally with 195 countries recording wine consumption in 2023. Nevertheless, over half of global wine consumption is concentrated in five countries, with the top 10 markets accounting for 68% of all wine consumed. The EU represented 48% of the world's total consumption in 2023, a share that has significantly decreased since 2000 when it was estimated at 60%. And it is interesting here to look at what the lower production and consumption of 2023 means for the global supply and demand balance. This graph represents the amount by which wine production exceeds consumption over time. And when we calculate wine production, that data includes wine that goes into industrial uses like distillation, vinegar, wine-based beverages and spirits. And this varies from year to year, but it's approximately 30 million hectolitres annually. And so that 30 million hectolitres is represented by the shading at the bottom of the graph. And you can see that once these industrial uses are accounted for, production is unlikely to exceed consumption in 2023. So in other words, the decrease in consumption recorded last year should not bring further pressure on stocks, at least at the world level, given the low production volume that overall 
should bring equilibrium to the market. Now we look at wine consumption on a country by country basis and in this slide we can see the top 20 wine consuming countries. The 2023 consumption volume is shown in orange at the top and the percentage change compared to 2022 is in blue at the bottom. The USA continues to be the largest wine market in the world with a volume estimated at 33 million hectolitres. France and Italy follow with 24 and 22 million hectolitres respectively. On the bottom graph, we can see that the first five markets have all lost between 2 and 3% compared to 2022. And if we focus on the top 10 markets, only Spain and Russia performed better than the previous year, at least in volume terms. The market in China continued to contract and last year recorded a 25% fall in consumption. Finally, it's important to note that these data on wine consumption are only preliminary and should be interpreted with caution. It will take at least two or three years for consolidated and therefore reliable consumption data to become available. This year in particular, we're seeing some reports that distributors in key markets have been importing less and instead selling down their existing stock holdings to cope with inflationary pressures, which may affect the calculation of apparent consumption. Looking quickly at wine consumption per capita, here we have the total consumption of the top 20 wine consuming countries by volume on the left hand side in orange, uh, and on the right hand side you have the per capita consumption of the top 20 wine consuming countries in blue. Of that top 20, Portugal has the highest consumption per capita, 61.7 litres. France and Italy are the second and third largest consuming countries per capita, with 45.8 and 42.1 litres respectively. But just a reminder that these data do not capture the qualitative aspects of wine consumption behaviour, such as frequency of consumption, the share of drinking population, and the share of tourists' consumption as a, as a part of the national consumption, um, particularly in the case of Portugal. Now I want to conclude this overview of 2023 by looking at the international trade in wine. Global wine exports decreased by 6% to 99 million hectolitres in 2023, no doubt imp impacted by higher export prices and weakened international demand caused by inflation. In value terms, however, exports reached 36 billion euros, the second highest figure ever recorded. The strong performance of exports by value is reflected in a record high average export price of 3.6 euros per litre, a 2% increase compared to the already very high price level of 2022 and 29% above the average price of 2020. The likely explanation for this sharp increase in the average price per litre is the higher cost incurred by producers, importers and distributors as a consequence of global inflationary pressures. One point to bear in mind also is that the small 2023 harvest in the Northern Hemisphere has for the most part not yet reached the market. Given the current destocking and the average to smaller size of recent global vintages, it will be interesting to observe what impact a small harvest will have on global trade in terms of both volume and pricing. We move down to a more detailed breakdown of international trade by category. Bottled wine is in green, sparkling wine is in yellow, bag and box in pink and bulk wine in purple. Bottled wine, the largest category in volume and value, experienced a 9% reduction in volume although value declined at the slightly slower rate of 6%, confirming the trend of selling less at a higher price. Sparkling wine was the most resilient category with only a 4% decrease in volume and 1% decrease in value. Bulk wine was the most negatively affected category, being the only product category where value decreased at a faster rate than volume. Looking at the long-term trends for average price per litre in each category, the overall average prices for packaged wine have increased, particularly in the last two years for sparkling wines. For bulk wines, the trend is relatively flat, with a notable decrease in the average price of 7% in 2023. 
On this slide, we can see the top 10 exporters by volume on the top and by value on the bottom. In volume terms, the main exporter of wine is Italy in 2023 with 21.4 million hectolitres worth 7.7 .7 billion euros. It is followed by Spain with 20.8 million hectolitres representing a value of 2.9 billion euros and then France with 12.7 million hectolitres. In value terms, France leads the pack by a long way with export earnings of 11.9 billion euros. In 2023, these three countries together account for 56% of global export volume and 63% of global export value. As you can see from the boxes on the side of the chart, it is interesting to note that all top exporters, with no exceptions, saw a drop compared to 2022, both in volume and value. But it is important to keep in mind that export performance was linked to the small production of 2023, and this is particularly evident in the Southern Hemisphere countries, whose exports were certainly affected by the very low harvests of last year. On this next slide, you can see the ranking of the major exporters by average export price. For each country, we show the evolution over the last 10 years. At the bottom of the ranking, we see predominantly bulk wine exporters, while in top positions, we have mostly bottled and sparkling wine exporters. France, the USA and New Zealand are the three countries leading this ranking. As you can see, apart from a few exceptions, all countries experience significant increases in price in the last two or three years. If we focus on 2023, the USA, Germany and South Africa are the countries that recorded the largest price increases. Regarding imports, the USA, Germany and the UK are the top three markets in 2023. Together, these countries account for nearly 40% of the world's total volume of wine exports. Also in this case, you can see that the majority of countries reported negative growth rates compared to 2022. In particular, it's worth noting the very large declines registered in North America as a consequence of destocking, with the US dropping 15% in volume and 12% in value, and Canada dropping 10% in volume and 15% in value. Other markets that saw important reductions in imports are Belgium and China, the latter recording a 25% fall in imports by volume and 22% by value. The large European markets remained comparatively stable, with the UK, Germany, the Netherlands, Switzerland and France recording year-on-year -year falls in wine imports of between 1 and 5 percent. On this slide, we have the average import prices of the main wine importing countries. The majority of countries recorded an increase in price in 2023. The prices differ strongly between countries such as Germany, France and Portugal that import mostly bulk wine and countries such as Switzerland, Japan and the USA, which are large importers of high-end bottled and sparkling wines. Finally, the Market Internationalisation Index, which measures how much wine is consumed outside its country of origin. And this is an indicator of the degree of globalisation of the wine market. In 2023, this stands at 45%, reflecting a highly globalised wine market. Although we do note a decrease for the second consecutive year, and this is something to monitor, in the upcoming years. Now we move to some very preliminary estimates for 2024 wine production in the major wine countries in the Southern Hemisphere. It's important to note that these projections are based on early estimates of the wine grape harvest, which may still be ongoing in several regions. Therefore, these figures are subject to revision in the coming weeks or months. In this slide, you can see the forecasts for the major Southern Hemisphere wine producing countries. Overall, we anticipate a positive trend in wine production volume for 2024, with an expected increase of approximately 5% compared to the previous year. This growth is primarily attributed to bigger harvests in Australia and Argentina. In Australia, after wet growing conditions in the previous season, drier weather this season has led to an estimated 
21% increase in the size of the vintage in 2024 to 11.7 million hectolitres. In Argentina, initial estimates are for a vintage of 11.2 million hectolitres, up 27% on 2023. Conversely, Chile anticipates a lower production volume of approximately 9.9 .9 million hectolitres, representing a 10% decrease from 2023 and a 16% drop from its five-year average. This decline is attributed to a late harvest due to an unusually cool spring. In South Africa, the wine production volume in 2024 should be in line with last year. This overall low volume can be partly attributed to the 1-200 year extreme flooding in the Western Cape, as well as to high fungal disease pressure in certain areas. Despite adverse weather conditions, ex especially excessive rainfall during the flowering period, Brazil, with 3.4 million hectolitres, should see only a slight contraction with respect to the high production level of 2023. However, this volume still surpasses the average observed in recent years. As for New Zealand, it's too early to provide a precise estimate. However, initial reports suggest a comparatively low production in 2024. Please, once again, bear in mind that these are preliminary figures and they're subject to adjustment in the coming weeks and months. To conclude, the data we have seen encapsulates many of the challenges and the opportunities facing the vine and wine sector, and we are following these very closely in the OIV. The most important challenge that the sector faces is climate change. The impact of climate change on the 2023 vintage was very strong throughout the vine and wine world. It was not just heat, but extreme weather events and secondary effects such as fires and fungal diseases. We know that the grapevine, as a long-lived plant cultivated in often vulnerable areas, is strongly affected by climate change. Adapting to climate change and mitigating our own environmental impact are global challenges for the vine and wine sector that will require collaborative efforts. But we know that these efforts are already well progressed in many regions and in many countries, and we know that the vine and wine sector as a whole has a deep commitment to sustainability. And I want to note that the OIV has been and will continue to play an active role in sharing information, guidance and recommendations to facilitate a multinational approach to the challenges of climate change and to the positive development of sustainability in our sector. Looking at the difficult 2023 harvest, it is at least positive that there will not be a significant discrepancy between supply and demand at a global level. However, we know that aggregated global data hides a very heterogeneous reality because the supply and demand balance will differ sharply between countries and regions, depending on the type of product and the main markets. The geopolitical and economic events of recent years have disrupted markets all around the world in many different ways. At the same time, there's an underlying trend of decreasing consumption driven by demographic and lifestyle changes. Given the very complicated influences on global demand at the moment, it's difficult to know the precise extent to which the recent decline in consumption is a short-term or a long-term feature of the market. But it's clear that inflation is the dominant factor affecting demand in 2023. At the moment, it seems that inflationary pressures are easing, and we hope that this will continue. Overall, there's a strong need to understand the drivers of consumption and markets in a time of generational and geopolitical change. And this is where the OIV plays a key role, gathering and sharing data to help countries and the sector adapt to changing international demand. Innovation is a key element of that adaptation to respond to the growing interest in products that are environmentally friendly, transparent and aligned with concerns about lifestyle and well-being. Again, this is an area where the OIV is active, using its network of more than 500 experts to make scientifically based recommendations about innovation while maintaining the integrity of our products. Turning now to trade, with 45% of wine produced being exported, this is really the lifeblood of the sector. Volumes are down, but the positive increase in export values suggests that producers of bottled and sparkling wine have to some extent been able to pass on their increased costs. Of course, noting that this does not 
necessarily translate to increased profits for producers. But overall, the global trade environment is becoming more complicated. Understanding what is happening with international trade and seeking to facilitate trade within the scope of our mandate are areas where the OIV will be placing greater emphasis. I want to conclude by reflecting on the fact that 2024 is the OIV's centenary year. The OIV is very aware of the challenges and uncertainties facing the vine and wine sector in this centenary year at this particular moment. But equally, we know that there are incredible opportunities for our sector in terms of our level of scientific knowledge, the quality of our products, our capacity to innovate, our ability to communicate and to trade around the world. This centenary year is an opportunity for our 50 member countries to reinforce their commitment to the vine and wine sector and to the OIV. It's an opportunity to look forward to the next 100 years and beyond. Under the auspices of the OIV centenary celebrations, ministers from the OIV member states came together in Italy last month to examine the issues facing the sector. And we're looking forward to a further ministerial conference here in Dijon to coincide with the inauguration of our new headquarters. At the same time, we will present a new strategic plan at our General Assembly, also in October, which will set out our priorities for the next five years and, I hope, establish a platform for the next 100 years. The focus will be very much on supporting members and the sector to face the challenges and profit from the opportunities that I've mentioned today, and I look forward to, to revealing our new plan in due course. Thank you very much, and now we can take some questions. Thank you, Director General. Uh, we are more than 200 people online. Thank you all for your presence and your participation. And we obviously received several questions. We are trying to, to answer as much as we can. Uh, and we can start with a question from Vicky Corbils uh, asking, is it possible that data about consumption per country is not complete or that OIV didn't collect data from every from every country the data that we are showing here in uh, this report and on the screen today uh, we're really capturing uh, the top countries just uh, really to show you what's happening but in fact when we collect our data we are collecting data from uh, all of the countries and perhaps i'll uh, turn it over to giorgio for a bit more detail on that yeah Yes, thank you, Director General. Just to, to complement on what you just said, uh, in terms of uh, um, data coverage, we, of course, collect data on each and every country in the world. Uh, we do so uh, through our official OIV questionnaire for what concerns our member states, and then we complement this data uh, through some collaborations with other international organizations and other um, uh, data providers. So, uh, yes, the short answer is yes, we do collect each uh, data for each and every country. Uh, and therefore, the the global, the total global that you see uh, takes into account all the 194 countries. Thank you, Giorgio. And I just uh, I should introduce Giorgio Del Grosso, who is our, our head of the statistics department. Thank you. Now, moving forward to another question, uh, Fabiola Gonzalez uh, asks, could be that besides the inflation, the decrease in consumption has to do with the too much attention to China and younger consumers instead of paying more attention to traditional consumers, old consumer countries and pot potential ones like Latin America, South Africa and others? Uh, well, the fall in consumption uh, this year is really due to a number of factors, as I say, uh, inflation, uh, smaller production, uh, but underlined that there are also some uh, uh, changes in uh, consumer preferences. Um, it's really difficult at this moment to, to disaggregate uh, which proportion of uh, that decline is attributed to, uh, to which cause. Um, yeah, but I, I think uh, it's it's a very multi-factorial uh, situation. 
Now the question from Peter Belling. Um, looks like the sparkling wines are sellings go higher world worldwide. Could we take an advantage with this kind of wines? Certainly, uh, the trend at the moment is for uh, sparkling wine uh, to grow very strongly, and we see, we're seeing it as uh, probably the most uh, resilient uh, category in the wine world at the moment. And I think that's uh, very positive because it's also uh, a high value category. Uh, certainly, a number of uh, countries around the world are uh, benefiting uh, from that, and it's uh, something for all countries in the world to to keep in mind because it is a product I think is is very much aligned with current uh, consumer demand. Yeah, maybe just to to complement, uh, as uh, uh, you might know, uh, at UAV we we have several uh, statistical publications every year. In particular, we have what we call thematic focus, and uh, uh, we've published uh, already two on the sparkling wine market, uh, and. All data uh, highlights that uh, sparkling wine is by far the category that is uh, um, most successful uh, uh, in, on the market. Uh, just to give you an idea, in terms of production and consumption, it has tripled in volume um, since 2002. Uh, and therefore, uh, yes, uh, I think that uh, it is certainly a category that uh, is is performing extremely well uh, and uh, it is uh, uh, something that can help the industry navigating in these uh, turbulent times. Now, um, Cécile Poursac uh, is asking, do you think all this data will help rebalance supply and demand in the global wine market? This this year, I think uh, yes, we will see uh, some equilibrium in uh, global supply and demand. Uh, that is, of course, a global picture because, as I mentioned, uh, on a, a country or regional level, uh, supply and demand uh, will vary. Uh, balance will vary uh, depending on. Uh, the nature of the products and the markets that the products are being sold into. We now have a Rudy Rittenberg asking uh, if would you be able to provide some background on the continuing consumption decline in China? Uh, also a second question, will the small 2023 harvest translate into further upward price pressure in 2024? with an inverse impact on consumption? Uh, first question with regard to China. Uh, we've seen a very interesting evolution with the Chinese uh, market since 2000 because it grew very, very strongly uh, until 2018. Uh, but since then, uh, within China particularly, uh, you know, there's been uh, COVID uh, and uh, like many countries around the world, uh, inflationary pressures are uh, are having their effect in that market. And as a very uh, young market, uh, you can see that uh, consumers, uh, I guess, uh, with their discretionary income, that perhaps they're not uh, preferring wine at this particular moment. But, uh, you know, I think as a young market, we can expect to see some uh, fluctuations and ups and downs. And as uh, the Chinese economy bounces back, I'm sure that we will see consumption in that market bounce back as well. Uh, the second question, sorry, was... The second question, just a moment, was uh, will the small 2023 harvest translate into further upward price pressure in 2024 with an inverse impact on consumption? Uh, well, again, there are a number of factors at play because uh, the biggest uh, driver of the price increase uh, appears to have been inflation in 2023, and that seems to be uh, easing off uh, this year. Uh, whether or not the smaller 2023 vintage will affect uh, supply and demand balance and uh, prices in, in this respect probably depends a little bit uh, on the extent of uh, stock holdings uh, globally. Uh, so it's a little bit, uh, probably a bit too soon to tell on that one. 
Now, uh, Adriana Seron would like to know what can you tell us about changes in consumption trends between whites and reds? Uh, we have certainly seen uh, quite a strong shift in consumption trends between uh, white and red wine. So the the the, glow, the overall trend is uh, for red wine consumption to be trending downwards, and that's uh, that's partly due to a decrease in red wine consumption in uh, traditional uh, wine consuming markets of Europe, and uh, also the overall decline in consumption in China. But at the same time, we've seen very strong growth in sparkling wines, in rosé wines, and in dry white wines. And we do uh, we did actually re um, release earlier this year a report specifically about the trends in uh, colours of wine, which you can find on our website. So I recommend that you take a look at that. Well, we have here a question from Jan Ruck. Uh, can you monitor the low alcohol wines as a part of the total wines? Uh, at the moment, uh, low alcohol wine, as we understand, is a very, very small part of the market. So it's probably not really uh, showing up in the data. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's a very interesting trend. It's something that gives our consumers uh, more options, but it's still... Uh, starting from a very uh, small base, so uh, I don't think we're really uh, capturing it in the data at the moment. A participant is asking, could the price of wine be another factor to explain consumption decrease? It looks that every time there is more gap between grape prices paid to growers and wine. Uh, well, in terms of price, it's 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 quite an interesting market because, uh, yes, overall, I think uh, we can look at 2023 and say that uh, the increase in price, uh, increase on price on one side, but on the other side, uh, the decrease in purchases spending power uh, is something that uh, has affected consumption very strongly. But again, it's quite... Um, uh, it's quite differentiated throughout the market because, in fact, some uh, premium high price products uh, have continued to perform very strongly, uh, even particularly with uh, high end red wines. Uh, we're seeing that those perform very strongly. Sparkling wine, the highest uh, price category in the market, continues to be the most resilient and uh, perform the most uh, strongly as well. Freddie Angulo asks if we have records that younger generations prefer wines with low alcohol content or zero alcohol. We're certainly seeing an upsurge in interest for uh, low and uh, zero alcohol wines, although, as I said, from a very, very small base. Uh, anecdotally, it does uh, seem to be something that uh, is of interest to uh, newer wine consuming generations, but uh, I don't uh, have the firm data on this at the moment. Another participant is asking, uh, what do you think the outlook for 2024 will look like? Uh, will consumption keep decreasing? Uh, well, that's a very interesting question. I think, uh, as we mentioned, we'll see uh, an equilibrium between supply and demand, which is a very positive thing, and we'll hopefully uh, see an easing of inflationary pressure. And those uh, things, uh, particularly the easing of inflationary pressure, I think will have an impact uh, on uh, consumption levels. We, I mean, there is a, a long-term trend of decline in consumption, so, um, you know, we, whether we see that trend continue or whether we see things stabilise as uh, in, inflation stabilizes, I think, remains to be seen. Uh, as a person would like to know if there is any consideration for tracking formats outside bottle and bag in box, like can, tetra. Uh, I I think that's uh, it's a very uh, interesting uh, something to look at. Uh, we certainly. Again, 
seeing a lot of interest in new types of packaging such as cans and uh, tetra packs and, and other formats. Um, the production base for those products, as I understand it, is still uh, very, very low. Um, I'm not sure that we're necessarily uh, capturing those specifically uh, in our data, um, but uh, it's something that we're uh, keeping an eye on in the OAV. Manuela Weber Witz uh, asks, uh, may you mention something about consumption and health awareness, please? Uh, yes, certainly. I think uh, uh, at, at this point in time, we, uh, uh, we are very uh, aware that uh, consumers are quite uh, uh, health conscious um, and uh, within the wine sector, uh, we are very much supportive of moderate and responsible low-risk uh, consumption and, and certainly do not support in any way uh, abusive uh, or excessive uh, consumption habits for wine. Um, and uh, we're very interested in some of these new products which give uh, consumers options like uh, low and no alcohol wine. We have uh, once again Rudy Rittenberg uh, from Bloomberg that would like to second another question about the sparkling styles. He's asking, are all benefiting or some more than others like Cava, Prosecco? Uh, I might have to turn that one uh, over to my colleague. Yes, thank you, Director General. Um... Overall, from our analysis, uh, that uh, as I um, uh, as I was saying before, we published uh, in our uh, latest thematic focus on the sparkling wine markets, where you can get all this data. Uh, what we see is that uh, basically all categories of um, of sparkling wine uh, are uh, are uh, witnessing an incredible growth. Of course, Prosecco is the leader, uh, in, is, is uh, seeing uh, an exceptional growth, but all the other uh, countries, notably Spain with Cava and, uh, of course, Champagne and, uh, and uh, also mm, sectors so of the, the German sparkling wines are doing extremely well. So overall, we see very positive growth rates in basically all categories. Now moving to the question of Marco Moreschi, uh, saying, in recent years in Italy, we have had many expectations about the Chinese market in the hope that it will be an excellent opportunity for our exports. Now, after COVID, everything seems to be over. What is the OIV's point of view on this matter? Uh, well, I think uh, you know China is is a very large and very important market, but it's still uh, a young market for wine. It's still developing, and we can expect to see uh, some ups and downs over time. But uh, it, it, you know, it's really important to recognise that uh, uh, the current decline in consumption is linked to uh, some of these uh, one-off events like COVID, and uh, also uh, the sort of global inflationary pressures. So. Um, you know, I, I, I certainly uh, would uh, would think that there's a, a lot of uh, interest in uh, China as a market in the future. Um, the participant is saying, uh, you mentioned the new IV strategic plan. What will be the priorities uh, for your mandate? So the priorities for my mandate, well, uh, this year, uh, we're in the last year of our uh, current five-year strategic plan, and we're developing uh, a new five-year strategic plan for the period 2025 to 2029. And uh, for me, that starts with a very strong vision for the OAV to be the trusted international uh, scientific and technical reference organization for the world wine industry. Uh, we need to set ourselves very strong scientific priorities around uh, the, the, the issues that are really important for the vine and wine sector, uh, including 
uh, climate change and sustainability, including understanding uh, the consumers uh, and markets of tomorrow, including uh, vine, wine and society, including innovation, including uh, international trade. We're going through the process of developing that at the moment, and we hope that also with those uh, scientific priorities, we'll also uh, have some organisational priorities to make sure that the uh, OAV as an organisation can deliver those, and we're working towards approval of that strategic plan at our generally, General Assembly, which coincides with the inauguration of our new building and with the Ministerial Conference in October uh, this year. Now, uh, Celia Bergin uh, is asking, uh, how do you expect El Niño, La Niña, to impact key growing nations over 2024? Oh, I, I don't know that I know the answer to that question. I think we might have yeah. to uh, just consult with our viticultural experts and uh, come back to you on that one. Uh, another question from Adriana Seron. How long will it take for China to become an exporter rather than an importer of wine? Uh, I, I don't think I can speculate on that. I think uh, uh, we still see interest in uh, the development of the wine industry in China. I think we have to remember that although China has uh, nearly 800,000 hectares uh, planted, the majority of that is for uh, table grapes and raisins. The wine sector there uh, is still uh, comparatively small compared with the rest of their uh, vineyard size, but it's growing strongly and in fact uh, making uh, very good and interesting wine. Another participant is asking why surface area uh, is shrinking, shrinking at the world level? There are a number of factors there and I and one thing to bear in mind is that when we're looking at the global vineyard surface area, that's the surface area for all grapes. And quite a lot of the decline or the, the shrinking in the global vineyard surface area has actually been in countries that are producing uh, predominantly table grapes. So we're talking there about uh, Turkey, about uh, China, um, about Iran uh, and uh, other countries as well. Um, so that's that's one part of the uh, declining global surface. Part of it also uh, is uh, the balancing that you see uh, within the EU with their their program to uh, ensure that uh, the vineyard uh, surface area um, you have a balance between supply and demand there, and uh, that's resulted in the in the last few years in a decline in the vineyard uh, size there. Uh, but also in other countries as well, uh, with adaptions to climate change, with adaptions to the uh, economic situation, we have seen vineyard surface uh, area shrink as well. We have here other question um, saying, seems the command drops, but the price is still high. How do you explain that? Is that a sign for something? Sorry, I, I... Seems the command drops, but the price is still high, the commanding. The command, you mean the, the orders? The order, uh, the, yes. The demand, okay. Uh, yes, well, I think uh, it's it, a lot of that is about inflation because it is about um, uh, people uh, drinking uh, less, but uh, the price is increasing because of inflation. Um, but also there's a general trend in the sector, uh, and I think this is a very a strong trend for the sector and quite a positive one, to drink less but to drink better. Uh, and that's that's the kind of underlying trend that we're seeing there also. Another participant is asking, how are producers adapting to climate change? There's a very wide range of adaptations because there are a very wide range of effects of climate change. Uh, we're seeing uh, a, a, a range of things from, for example, uh, examining uh, the genetic heritage of grapevine varieties to find varieties that are well adapted to the climate. We're of course seeing uh, actions like um, uh, 
water management, soil management, canopy management uh, in the vineyard. Um, we're also uh, thinking about the choice of varieties, the, the place of planting, um, and uh, yeah, there's, there's quite a lot of adaptations that will vary uh, in accordance with the, the, the country. Within the OIV, we've done a great deal of work on climate change, on ad adaptation, and on resilience in the vineyard. Uh, and we uh, continue to work on that and to bring uh, countries together to pool information to share their approaches to uh, progress on, on this. Because it's really uh, an issue where uh, no one region, no one producer, no one country has all the answers. As a sector, we need to work together uh, to find ways to adapt to climate change. We are moving to the last questions, and in case you're still wanting to ask more questions, uh, please be quick because we have just a few minutes left. We have here uh, another person's question asking, what role will wine tourism play in your next strategic plan? Uh, I think that wine tourism will be a part of our next strategic plan. We're very much looking at uh, the broader value of wine and uh, vine products. Let's not forget uh, uh, table grapes and raisins as well. Uh, and uh, wine tourism is an important part of that because it, it really uh, allows people to uh, experience uh, the social and cultural value and uh, to contribute to uh, regional development while they do that. So it's something that's very positive. It's something that uh, I know that we're going to have uh, a statistical focus on. Uh, we're working with uh, international partners like the United Nations World Tourism Organization on that. So it is uh, it is an aspect that is uh, very interesting and important to us. Well, as far as we can see here, uh, there aren't any other questions coming. These uh, press conference files are available on the chat. And also, if you have any other questions coming, please feel free to contact the communication department. You have the contacts on the press release that is also available on the chat. Um, thank you, everyone, for your questions. And I will give the last words to our Director General to his uh, farewell uh, words. Well, simply to say thank you, everyone, for your attention for your participation and uh, good evening or good morning or good afternoon, whatever part of the world you're in. Thank you once again.